can see. And uh, ever since uh, Minister Tan assumed his job at the, the leading position in the government, we see an open and innovative communication between the two. And also, we see her effort in bridging the older and the younger community. And uh, we see positive impact on the digital transformation uh, in the industry. Although, as you can see, as young as our audience in the room, Minister Tan has a great uh, experience in his life. And uh, we are really uh, pleased and privileged to have uh, Minister Tan to come to the room and then share with us and interact with us. So let's welcome Minister Tan. Hello everyone, really glad to be here and I see that people are still trickling in. Uh, and so for the next two hours or so, this will be an entirely crowdsourced meaning that you will decide what I talk about. So if you have mobile phone or any device that can, can connect to the great internet, uh, please go to this website, slido.com, that's S-L-I-D-O.com. And once you're in this website, please enter this number without a pound sign. That's 001013 to this date. Uh, and then you will get into this anonymous chat room. Now, um, the, the reason why this is anonymous chat room is that for many classes, when people raise their hand, I'm sure that you're all very willing to raise your hand and ask questions, but sometimes um, it, you, you kind of tone down um, the, the sharpness or the directness of the questions uh, because of coach up, peer pressure, whatever. But because it's anonymous, uh, feel free to ask any direct questions. Everybody using their phone, anybody in the news who's asking that question. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that if you see a question that you would also like to um, see answered, please press like uh, so to bump that question high up uh, in the screen. And I will answer in the order of your questions. Now I'm going to sit down and um, introduce briefly my work in the Taiwan administration while you think about the questions. It could be related to the reading um, that I kind of assigned, uh, but I don't know how many of you have actually read it all. Um, it, it's kind of a small booklet, it's mean as provocative, so I won't be you know, asking any questions, but feel free to ask me questions about this book. Uh, but feel free to also ask any questions related or unrelated to the very idea of open innovation, open revolution. Now, I would like to uh, share with you a few uh, lectures that on Air Force Base. Now it is the Contemporary Culture Lab or C Lab. Now within C Lab there is this corner called the Social Innovation Lab and this is co-created by a hundred or so of social innovators who make all the different wishes like there should be a kitchen, there should be a residence chef, we should open until 11 p.m. every day, uh, the minister should come every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. to listen to people and so on and we grant all these wishes and look, this is literally co-created by hundreds of people and I am uh, here everyone talk to people. And there's people with various contributions. For example, there's people with Down syndrome organized uh, by a, uh, what we call Xihang or Children Arts or Carers Foundation, uh, who uh, offer the paintings made by those people with Down syndrome. Turns out they see the world with a very different lens and they're very artistic. And so we, we are in this very playful um, atmosphere and experiment with all sorts of things, such as those self-driving tricycles uh, that are sort of shaped like, you know, extraterrestrial beings, but they're actually uh, a one of the good symbol of, of innovation because first that they drive kind of slow, uh, it doesn't hurt anyone if they bump into buildings or something, and second it's all open source, meaning the source code, the programming logic of its operation is entirely in the open. Uh, the main makers uh, from the MIT Media Lab uh, has relinquished most of their copyright, so anyone can just take the brain of one of these creatures and just do some modifications so that it is it's your own personal um, scenario, for example, walking or strolling along the Jingle Flower Market, you want to pick up some orchids and put it on those tricycles, and by the end of you hop on it, it drives it home or something like that. So um, some people work on interactive tourism guide so that they can speak with you while it strolls past you know, historical buildings and things like that. So 
It's very easy to modify, very easy to change. And also uh, because the data that it got us is also open as well. So it not only helps these machines understand human society more, but also it helps the human society understand these machines more in the sense that we can enter into their um, mind and see how it, uh, why it makes such a decision, why does it stop in this way, why does it feel confused, and things like that, through uh, kind of colored lights. And there's people also working on replacing that light, maybe into a face of a cat or a face of a dog or things like that, to to show the emotion um, that the, the machine is feeling, quote unquote, uh, around their surroundings, and so to enable a better human machine uh, interaction. And so this doesn't actually make everyone a programmer or a coder, but it does make self driving vehicles a social object around which the people have, can have a real conversation. Instead of some abstract rules and uh, regulations, this could be a new social norm, new social interaction that you can replay afterwards and co-determine the right boundaries and the right interaction patterns um, that we must um, you know, um, adjust as a society to allow for these kind of creatures. So there's um, any number of experiments going on uh, inside this experimentation uh, sandbox. Uh, and so the, the real reason why we run a lot of sandboxes like this, it could be physical, it could be virtual, and so on, is because we want to shift the governance system from the uh, previous century system, uh, which is um, epitomized by this. Uh, for example, people caring about economic development may talk with the Minister of Economy on the left, uh, and people caring about the environment may talk to the Environmental Protection Agency on the right, and then the, the invisible bit in between is the career public service uh, that kind of absorbs attention and try to you know organize people with different interests and make a judgment, make a arbitration, and things like that. And this is kind of the model that kind of worked uh, before the invention of the social web. And after that, it, it all crumbles down because first, uh, people don't need the counselors or the ministers to organize themselves anymore. Anyone with the right hashtag can easily organize tens of thousands of people. People really donate intermediaries as organizers. They have the internet and the internet enables spaces as organizers. And the second thing is that there's just so many emerging issues, right? The distributed ledgers, um, the machine learning, uh, virtual reality, all these different things. We cannot just set up one new ministry or one new agency or one council for each emergent issue. And none of these emergent issues have clear belongings uh, within the existing um, you know, siloed governmental system. System. So this is clearly a bankrupt model. And so how should we uh, fix the model? Uh, we do this by shifting the fundamental questions of governance from asking uh, how should we organize people and how do we make you know, balanced uh, judgments into two different, very different questions. First, given those people's different positions, can we manage to discover some common values? And once we discover some common values, can anyone come with, uh, with innovations that doesn't leave anyone behind, that makes it you know, uh, working, or at least uh, livable, uh, that people can live with, uh, those new innovations that doesn't leave anyone behind. And now if you have taken sustainable development um, you know, goals, classes, that is the, the idea of the triple bottom line, meaning that new innovations must at once take care of a sustainable economy, sustainable environment, and sustainable society. And so when I was uh, in New York during the, during the UNGA, uh, it's very easy to introduce to all the different uh, people attending the UNGA the work that I'm doing. I'm just saying, you know, I'm working on 1718, 1717, 1716, and, and that's it, right? So out of the 169 um, global goals, uh, I'm working, personally working, um, making reliable data available to all the different sectors, encouraging effective partnerships, and making those innovations open so that everybody can share it. And so the one example um, that I will use uh, of this kind of social innovation before I switch back to the slide of questions is the airbox. Um, uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of the, this uh, innovation called airbox in Taiwan, if you have. One, two, okay. So I'll take maybe five minutes <laughs> to, to explain this, I think, amazing innovation. Um, so the airbox is a really, really cheap, like less than 100 US dollars, um, micro sensor of um, air quality. So uh, you can very easily get a kit from many vendors, it's open, open hardware. 
And once you do, you can easily wear it around. You can put it on your balcony or on your school. There's many primary schools using it as a environmental education tool, and it automatically detects the PM 2.5 levels, various different air quality levels of the surroundings inside that air box. Now, the idea, very simply put, is that you can um, measure the air quality that's closer to your uh, where you live instead of relying on the environmental protection agency's um, um, station, which may be more precise, but it's like 500 meters away or something, right? Uh, but that, that doesn't end it, right? So in addition of making it available and accessible and affordable, there is a community uh, called the LAS community, uh, sponsored by people, professors in Academia Sinica here, uh, that makes a um, online platform for everybody to freely upload uh, and automatically um, those IoT sensors numbers. And now once people aggregate those, all their numbers, first you can rule out the outliers, and then you can uh, take the longitudinal study to see how human activity affects those um, air qualities in a smaller scale than the sparsely located environmental protection agency. But it doesn't end there. There is a movement in Taiwan called Go Zero that I'm a part of. Um, Go Zero is this very simple idea. Whenever you see any government website, that all an NGOV that TW, okay? uh, and you see that this website, for example, I don't know the um, legislative, um, that is LYGOVTW. If you feel that this website doesn't offer the service to your liking, or that it could be improved, or whatever, instead of protesting, you can just make a ly.g0v.tw, a, a shadow government website that shows your vision of how this government service or website should be made better in an open way. And so you don't have to do um, search engine optimization or anything. And can, one can just take any kind of website, turn their O to a zero, and then get into the shadow government. And so this is the uh, um, ENV, uh, g0v.tw, is a good zero environmental um, visualization network that uh, aggregates the Seneca people's uh, numbers and show it in a way that reflects the wind, um, the, the meteorological data and so on, so people can at a glance see how the um, air quality is doing. But this is very unique, especially in Asia, because when I talk with various um, uh, delegates from the Asian countries, they all point out that this would actually challenge the legitimacy of the central government. Because if you measure a number, and it's number A, and the central government publish a, another number, which is number B, and when those two usually they agree, but once they differ, of course you're going to believe the one that you personally put there, <laughs> instead of the, the one that's put there by the central administration. But perhaps uniquely in Asia, um, in Taiwan, we see that the freedom of expression, assembly, and so on, is core value, they're not instrumental value. So the very fact that there are citizen scientists is a value in itself. So in, instead of you know, fighting or competing with them, we just allocate a little bit of budget uh, to, to work with them. And this is why we call the civil, the civil IoT project at ci.taiwan.gov.tw. And uh, you can also read CI as collective intelligence, ci.taiwan.gov.tw. And it's not just air, but also meteorology data, including water, earthquake, disaster prevention, and so on. This open innovation has already <laughs> spread uh, worldwide. And so uh, we aggregate all these data into the uh, National Center for High-Speed Computing. And so people with different um, models of uh, two-phase flow or whatever, they can upload their models and use the same data, the same aggregate data from the different sectors to uh, predict the, the weather and to compare and to generally do science. Because pre prior to this, when you have two different prediction models, uh, maybe one is more precise, but you don't know whether it's because they have better data or if they have better code. But now we have the same data and we'll make sure that we cannot change or modify any data because before they upload it, they put it on a distributed ledger. They put it on IOTA. So using block blockchain governance, they make sure that uh, the government cannot change the numbers the day before the election. So all in all, this is a very um, interesting social infrastructure to make sure the parties all trust each other and based on the same data that we can uh, make other innovations. And so the solution is not just pertaining to Taiwan, but we can also spread it to everyone. Okay, so that's my 10 minutes pitch. And let's see <laughs> what kind of things people want to want me to talk about. And, and as a gentle reminder, um, you can ask me any question uh, during my answer, and if you raise your hand, then that takes higher priority than the slider here. And so uh, at any time, like including now, feel free to just raise your hand and start a conversation.
right? Uh, and remember to like each other's questions, so that you will uh, show the signal so whether you are interested in uh, seeing a question or not. So the first question, with one vote so far, is this. What will be in the future when everyone can fully control their digital data? Would it be a better world or in a mess? This is a great question. Um, now, I, I tend to see data as a relationship, um, as a beginning of a relationship, so to speak, especially personal data. Um, in many literatures, you see data referred as kind of a tangible asset, as a countable noun, right? The term big data, the term data as the new oil, data as asset, data, um, I don't know, data pool, data lake, data whatever, uh, any water-related metaphor has been used to, to data. But, but, but I think um, data flow really is, is a flow of a people-to-people -people relationship. Um, I don't know how many of you uh, here have at least heard of the General Data Protection uh, Directive, the GDPR of the European Union. If you have, please raise your hand. Okay. About half of you, that's great. So, um, so GDPR, and, and this is kind of important, so um, please, if you haven't heard of GDPR, uh, do read up on it because it is one of the uh, most important regulations at the moment uh, that talks about data in, as a relationship instead of as a kind of tangible asset. Um, and the GDPR, very simply put, says if I have some personal data that I entrust an institution, it could be governmental or private sector or social sector, if I entrust you to um, store the data, then you become the data operator. Now we begin a relationship. At any point, I can ask you, have you been using this data that I entrusted to you for some other purpose that I did not anticipate? If not, you have to tell me, you have to inform me. And at any point, I can say, this data describes me as of three years ago or one month ago, and this is no longer accurate. I want to change the data, and you need to give me this option. At any point, I can say, tell me what extra data you have aggregated from other sources about me. I would like to know it in a way that is easily understandable. And finally, it says, you know, if you have a lot of data of mine, but I want to take all these data into a different operator so that, um, you know, those people can provide a better service and I would like you to delete all the data. I want to change a new data operator. You need to provide it in a portable form. And so all these is relationship, right? Uh, I can ask for an account at any time. And the data operator need to be accountable at any time. And the mechanism, the, what we call privacy by design mechanism, that makes this automatic and not at all mm, time consuming for anybody involved is called accountability mechanism. And so uh, in, in Mandarin Chinese, we translate that into wenzi, dangzi, and kezi jiqi, respectively. And, but it's all the same word in English, really. It's accountability. And, and that shows data accountability is a dynamic relationship. And so um, nobody really can fully control data around us. But we can say who is these data operators that we're currently having a data relationship with, and then during their relationship to either earn each other's trust by making it transparent, accountable, about what kind of data is being processed, what kind of purpose is being used, and so on, or if they do not earn the trust, at least they, we, we have the right to, um, for example, um, to be forgotten by that data operator and take our business and our data elsewhere. And so this is, a relationship-based view instead of a transaction-based view. If you take a transaction-based view, it will kind of privilege large aggregation in a way that maybe, you know, it's all a uh, pale shadow of your profile that's maybe three years ago, four years ago, it describes one aspect of you, but they are using it for another purpose. One uh, particular example I would like to use um, is that when a large multinational corporation first roll out automatic machine learning, AI-based captioning for all the photos that people stored uh, in their cloud storage, 
um, they used a um, um, data source called the ImageNet. And ImageNet is kind of like a taxonomy um, textbook. It's kind of like an encyclopedia that, that shows um, the image and the caption. Like for a dog, there's any kind of dog. And so for a car, there's many kinds of cars. And it's all tree-like knowledge representation. It is not meant, actually, to be used uh, for labeling people's friends, um, families, photos, and so on. But because it's one of the only really um, um, large-scale open image um, training sources available, it is nevertheless used uh, to train the machine learning labeler of that large multinational. And so the result of which is that when people uploaded um, friends, uh, their friends' photo and their friends are of African uh, origin, um, many of them are labeled as gorillas. And, and this is a very bad situation. I mean, PR-wise, this is a very bad situation, but human rights-wise, this is an even worse uh, situation. Because in, in ImageNet, the, the diversity is simply not there. So when machine learning just takes a data set that is um, it's like nutrition labels, you know, that is not balanced in its diversity, then it would tend to make predictions that contain bias that are not, nevertheless not imagined by the original providers of the data. Now, had the data, the ImageNet um, data donors uh, understood that it would be eventually used for labeling a friend's face and things like that, they would probably um, design a new data collection method. They would probably ask for people's donation of around people of different ethnicities and so on, instead of being used out of purpose and so on. And so this alignment of the purpose of the data use and the initial purpose of data collection, this calls for a long-term relationship that people can always look at what's being collected, what's being used, and really understand. And so this is what we call data literacy. So I think once people have this kind of awareness of the right that you have, if you're a EU citizen, uh, um, to have uh, as a GDPR subject, then I think the world really will be in a better place because then we can always, yes, Okay. Would you like me to use the mic to just to, to make that recording easier? So I'm French, and so I have to agree about um, all the, the use of uh, my personal data. For, for example, my Google account and everything, I received a lot of emails. And I'd like to have your opinion about, I think it's better to have more transparency, but really change really something. Because if you, cannot, if you can, don't agree with the data you are using, you will not be able to use the app anyway. So I received a lot of uh, messages from all my my accounts, like Facebook, like Google, like uh, a lot of things. But all my friends, me, I was reading some of some of the things, and it was really scary. I think because they were saying, "So yeah, now we have to tell you what we are doing, and we do that, 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 that." But at the end, you just accept it because you want to still use the to still use the uh, the application or the service. So do you think it will really change something? Because People are more aware, but they are not really reading, and they are like, yeah, nothing will happen. So I'm a bit, I don't know if, I, if it's really a good advance or not. Yes, this is a great question. So the question is that, is a networked effect large enough that people, even though knowing the vendor login and the privacy violations, will nevertheless succumb to the network effect? And this is precisely why the GDPR put in the data portability clause. Because at the a, at a moment, everybody understands that if you use, for example, I don't know, Facebook Messenger. Maybe some of you use Facebook Messenger. I, I don't, but maybe some of you do. Um, then um, in Facebook Messenger, uh, they have a end-to-end -end encryption mode that makes it um, the conversation you have uh, visible only to you and the recipient of the message. But it's turned off by default. You have to actually click like four times to activate the end-to-end -end encryption in Facebook Messenger. And uh, when I visited Facebook HQ and have a conversation with their VP, um, they, they did uh, admit that you know this is what, what, what they call hostile design, right? You have to jump through a lot of hoops to, to get the privacy they want. And the real reason, of course, is that they really find the conversation you're having in instant messenger very valuable uh, in targeted advertising, which is their real business model anyway. Uh, now, I, I'm saying this not as an attack to Facebook, although it may be construed as such. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but GDPR, at least, just as you said, uh, makes it 
um, clear. When you go to Facebook, click download all the data, which they're kind of forced to put in there because of GDPR, right? And then you click download all the data, then you find out how exactly Facebook knows about you and uh, the instant messages and actually a lot more. Once you, I highly encourage all of you, if you use Facebook, to click that download all my data to discover how much Facebook knows about you. And so, um, and so then people become aware that, oh, maybe I should switch to a different instant messenger. And I mean, there are a lot of great end-to-end um, -end, um, encryption alternatives. Personally, I use Wire, which is designed by people who design Skype. Uh, there are people who use Signal. There are people who use Telegram and it's end-to-end -end encryption mode. Um, even Line actually defaults to end-to-end -end encryption, uh, except for the stickers. Uh, they know all the stickers you're using um, because <laughs> it also shows, because of GDPR, very clearly that we collect the usage of all the stickers when and where and who you're sending the stickers to. But but the, at least the text itself is end-to-end uh, -end encrypted, and so. I mean, at least it raises awareness. It shows that alternative is possible, and the Facebook cannot um, disallow you to export your contact list and to switch part of the system. I'm not saying that you are not using Facebook as you know a blog or whatever other um, I don't know live streaming or whatever features. I use those too, right? But I don't use it for end to end for for one to one messaging because it's a hostile design. And so I think it does make a change after the GDPR and the forced enclosure, uh, disclosure of what people, Facebook knows about people. Coupled with Cambridge Analytica, <laughs> we, we, we do see uh, that Facebook publicly uh, say that people uh, who spend time on Facebook um, has declined, uh, which leads to a decline to their stock price. Um, and I think uh, eventually, I think uh, Facebook will eventually, I think, switch gradually away from the idea that you can, you know, use their instant messengers, store their text in their servers, using that for advertisement uh, analysis or sentiment analysis. I, I, I don't think it's a very sustainable business model, but on the other hand, I don't run Facebook. But in any case, there are now sufficient alternatives around that particular practice of Facebook that I do see people switching to other end-to-end -end encrypted. I mean, Facebook itself offers an alternative called WhatsApp, right? And so, so I think people, once become aware of it, there are sufficient alternatives that offers more or less the same uh, user experience that lets people migrate piecemeal. But this is not saying that you know um, one can suddenly quit the network effect. This is impossible. But we can at least build different networks around the different aspects of digital services. So I mean, this is a um, maybe decade-long project that people can find safe, useful, and um, you know. Um, I, I would say equally addictive, but it doesn't sound right. <laughs> um, equally behavior reinforcing uh, alternatives uh, of those uh, data silos. And that's the answer to your question. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Um, any other follow ups to this particular conversation? If not, let's go to the next one. Do you think that the digital innovation will help achieve the sustainable development goals? How? Well, the sustainable development goals doesn't say how. It says by 2030, we need to be here. But it doesn't say how we are going to get there. Um, and so without digital innovation, the how is very unclear. Uh, but with digital innovation, we can, we can do a lot of things. Um, for example, the sustainable development goals um, has a lot of uses, and I think one of the most interesting uses is just as a um, map. So this is um, built literally by uh, digital innovations. Um, here is the SDG index and dashboard report. Um, every continent, for example, Africa, has additional metrics and indicators that they care about. Uh, and you can see how close each country um, is reaching. Uh, their goals and which particular goals they still need uh, work on, and all of this is built on um, digital um, systems. Uh, and independent, um, independent 
um, peoples in other sectors um, have built their own dashboards. This is built by the GSMA, uh, the GSM Alliance, uh, to work on mobile-based um, endless that helps the goals. And one of the great thing about the goals is that they, the 17 goals all have different colors. So just by looking at colors, you can see which kind of end of us that people are working on using mobile technology. For example, if we click this one, then it's here. Here we go. So if you want to look at um, where people have been working on um, gender equality, then you can see people working on gender equality, climate action, life below water and things like that. And if you drill down to it, um, you can see exactly which projects they're working on, what kind of CSR or um, USR or GSR projects that they, they're, they've worked into and so on. But it seems that it crashed the iPad, so I'm sure that the GSM people have some work to do, but <laughs> supposedly, supposedly it shows them what exactly the, each project is doing and so on. Um, but I mean, there are many indexes and reports uh, around this kind of thing. Uh, without the digital um, innovation, especially automated accountable data, it is impossible to even get the statistics of exactly how many people are impacted by each intervention. And so this is the, the main challenge, actually, when I was um, in New York. People all say that each, for example, African countries, they report um, the kind of mining um, um, effort they do, the, the lack of comp, the, the education work they do, the um, re reduction in conflict uh, in producing those mining materials and so on. But it, it's very difficult to independently verify. And when there's a direct intervention or involvement of international organizations, um, it's also very difficult to trace the flow of resources and money and so on. And so this is uh, one place where digital uh, technologies can help. I hope uh, this one doesn't crash the browser. Um, for example, when Nepal uh, suffered a flood, there's a lot of people uh, working here uh, in the NCU um, UNUS Social Business Center um, to, to work on disaster relief. And there is a project-based crowdfunding um, that uh, lets you, you know, donate and, for example, uh, send help to these people. Uh, when Nepal suffered from earthquake, actually, um, the OpenStreetMap people, um, how many of you have heard of OpenStreetMap? I'm sorry for the diversion, but um, because we were just talking about something that's useful and doesn't collect your personal data. And I figure all of you use Google Maps. So how many of you know that there is a free alternative to Google Maps that doesn't collect your personal data when you're using it for navigation? Oh, like one person. So, so here's a very useful alternative to Google Map that doesn't uh, collect your personal data. And it is actually contributed by the crowd. So it actually contains far more local, uh, locally useful data than, than Google Maps. And it's very um, beautiful as well. And I think Pokemon Go has switched to OpenStreetMap, which uh, in, in increases exposure. But in, in, in any case, uh, when Nepal suffered from the earthquake, the OpenStreetMap team um, handles the uh, satellite image that's taken right before and right after the earthquake and divide the satellite images into small grids and then the entire community um, at the time just crowded on each different grid and uh, marked whether there's a bridge that's uh, there and that's not broken, whether there's a road that was there that's not broken, where there was an empty space but now a tent has been set up with people, um, you know, walking to it and things like that. And within, I think, 48 hours, they completed the mapping of the before-after difference for the uh, frontline uh, people, um, you know, the Red Cross and the Red Crescent, the UN people, uh, when they actually send the supplies to it, they now know how to optimally route their uh, supply route to make sure that it actually goes to the right people. And that is a digital technology intervention that many people in Taiwan um, participated just by donating five minutes or 10 minutes time. And now this one, 
of course, tracks the, the use of resources, money and goods and so on across borders. And so maybe it passed through the UNU Center, uh, then the local UNU Center, and maybe also uh, across another intermediate organization and into Nepal. But whenever um, people make such a transaction, it's all recorded on the distributed ledger called Ethereum. Uh, it uses the Ethereum's public chain, meaning that everybody can just look at the Ethereum and reconstruct these numbers without the help of this website. So even if this website crashes your browser, if this website goes away, you can always easily reconstruct how exactly the money and resource flows for this particular project without any possibility for the website to modify it without uh, getting everybody's attention uh, that they are modifying the numbers. So it really uh, increased accountability and we know for as a fact that once people know more about um, how exactly the money is being used, they are more willing to donate for disaster relief and furthering the sustainable goals. So that's yet another way, in addition to crowdsourcing and crowd intelligence, um, that this kind of accountability mechanism helps the crowd to make uh, judgment calls on um, which um, relief efforts, which humanitarian efforts are more accountable and then direct their resource to it and so on. And so uh, I think if you look at the uh, globalgoals.org, um, which is the kind of canonical Pokédex of the Sustainable Demon Goals. Um, it's an index of the Pokémon's uh, icons. Uh, it shows exactly how digital innovation, uh, universal trading system, um, macroeconomic stability, global partnership, effective data, measures of progress, um, sustainable uh, technologies, used to be called appropriate technologies, meaning that technologies that are owned and understood by local people instead of like a colonization, um, and various other things. So if you want to know exactly how uh, technologies can help, please look at SDG 17 and to a lesser extent 16 about the exact uh, forms of digital innovations and how they can help. I'm happy to expand on this topic like forever, but there's other questions. Um, and so, so maybe if people don't have follow-up questions, we will move on. So some people asks, but information is power, unquote. Um, do I agree? And what is my take on civic hacking, such as WikiLeaks, and should they be prosecuted or not? Um, I thought knowledge is power, uh, but okay, information is power too. Um, but information um, is, a, is a different kind of power though. Um, many of you, uh, including me, uh, before I run into this internet thing in, in 1993, when I was 12 years old, um, living in the analog law, uh, world, think of power as a kind of top-down uh, vertical power. Now many of you are probably digital natives. Maybe when you hear power, you already think of hashtags. That, that's great then. Uh, you, you think of uh, power as horizontal power. Uh, a vertical power um, holds information. It operates on asymmetry of information. It operates on the principle that uh, if the people on the top knows more and people you know, um, reporting to them knows less, um, then they execute uh, dutifully to whatever the people on the top uh, makes a whole you know, overview decision. Uh, and maybe this is a kind of command and control uh, system. Uh, in many systems uh, that is not using information technology, we're still seeing that power structure. But people who are additional natives, people who have participated in, I don't know, Occupies <laughs> or any other uh, internet enabled movements. My first one was in 1997. Uh, it's called the Blue Ribbon Movement, where people uh, see that the, um, I think it's the Bill Clinton's government, uh, try to censor the internet for indecent material uh, and making sure that every website has to ask for a minor to identify their real name or whatever so that they, they don't see, you know, pornographic or whatever uh, materials. Um, and But it, it's done in a way that is very blunt and it actually makes small and medium publishers very difficult to survive uh, on the internet, and so everybody protested. All the website I visited became dark, uh, and everybody put blue ribbon on it. And that's the first time that I understood the internet not just as a place to share information, but also to mobilize to mobilize um, people's common aspirations and make a call for uh, the government 
to the internet alone, essentially. And so that is when I got into this uh, community called Internet Society, uh, which makes the case that internet is sovereign by itself and is not reporting to the US or to, to the United Nations ITU, although they do work with them. But the internet itself, so far, is ruled entirely by radical transparency and radical participation and not answering to any governmental bodies or multilateral bodies. It is uh, the largest multi-stakeholder system that's currently in operation. But it doesn't have an army or navy, so you may go away, right? So um, if, if you have some time, feel free to uh, participate and know just know more about the uh, internet governance issues. And so I, I do agree that it is power, but this kind of power, horizontal power, micro power, new power, there's many words to describe this kind of power, um, is stronger if more people share it. It doesn't hoard information. It makes it clear that the information is there and that is actionable. You can already contribute to the pool of information, as I showed about the airbox or about people's participation on mapping for Nepal or a donation or any call to action that is actionable. And also, this kind of horizontal power makes sure that it's connected. Whenever you do a donation or an action intervention of this kind, you will share it with your friends. Uh, some of you may remember the ice bucket challenge. Uh, that challenge is very boring if you do it alone. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> you just put some ice water in your head and doesn't let anyone know about it. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't feel good at all. But, no. but then people uh, share that video around and pack a few friends of theirs uh, so that they understand the humanitarian, uh, humanitarian cause, right? a, a uh, rare uh, disease that, that affects people and show that uh, we are in solidarity in uh, fundraising and so on uh, for, for these kind of people. And I think it, it's very people with this kind of condition, sorry. Uh, but I think this is very interesting that um, just by connecting people's actions, people feel that we're part of something larger, a larger movement. But the third thing, equally important, is the extensible. So that's the ACE principle, actionable, connected, and extensible. Extensible means that nobody owns trademarks, patents, um, the, the hashtag, simply put. So, I mean, I get to use the SDG icons, right? Because nobody's going to sue me by, by uh, using those icons. Um, and uh, in a very similar way, um, the GovZero movement explicitly um, released the logo of, of GovZero um, as uh, creative, creative Commons Zero, uh, meaning that um, we re relinquish uh, even the attribution rights. So this is completely in the public domain. And so anybody can just take this trademark-ish thing but not actual trademark, actual preempted, so that nobody can trademark it, uh, and then start local chapters. So like next month, actually, the GovZero that Italy is going to form, and they're, they, they, they're going to start with the same project that the GovZero started uh, in 2012, which is a visualization of the, their national budget, and making sure that each part of the budget becomes a social object that people can have a real discussion around it. Now, uh, because of zero, you know, relinquish of the copyright. So in Taiwan already, we have a website called join the GOV, the TW, uh, like join government Taiwan. So after forking or showing the government what's possible with the budget, it gets merged, meaning that the government now, instead of prosecuting the civic hackers, as the questioner asked or had been, um, we, we just harvest uh, the, the results of the budget visualization. So now in joint GOVTW actually, you can see all the central administration ministries, all those you know, 1,300 long-term and mid-term projects, everything that's more than one year uh, project, even completed ones, like 51 of them, uh, and just see exactly where the budget has gone. Uh, and the KPIs, the accumulated uh, use of the budget, which procurement, which spendings that they have done, and things like that, and it's all publicly released data. And each of them is a discussion board, so anyone can ask questions, and the real uh, living career public servants will come forward and answer your question without going through the par parliamentarians. Uh, and so, for example, this is the Kingman Bridge. The Kingman Bridge has an accumulated um, completion rate of the budget of 100% uh, as of 2016, April. 
but then the accumulated um, completion rate becomes 80% and then 35%. Now, um, you, you don't have to be a business major to understand that the accumulated is meant to go up <laughs> instead of go down. And so there's people uh, asking, you know, um, is there something wrong with this picture? <laughs> now, their orthography is not exactly uh, perfect, but, but people understand uh, the gist <laughs> of what they're asking about. Um, and then, of course, the Korea Public Service came uh, forward and, and really answered uh, and saying, you know, our vendor really, you know, is not executing very well, and then we waited for many months, and then we had to cancel the contract, and they gave us back the money, and we have already found a new vendor, and so on, and that is why the shake is look like this. And now, um, the Korean Public Service, they often get calls from the MPs, from the counselors, from the media, or whatever. But each person who makes the call doesn't know that this same answer has been answered 39 times ago by the same Korean Public Service. And so that means that there's a lot of extra redundant work. But just by visualizing the budget, making sure people can find a topic that, that they care about and have a real conversation, everybody else afterwards can just Google and find the right answer. And then if they, you know, just trouble, you know, email the same public servant, all they have to do is copy paste the URL to them and, and, and done, right? So which is why the career public service really like this system as well, because amortized it, it saves them time over time. And so this is why the Gov Zero movement is spreading. Um, to, to Ottawa, Toronto, New Zealand, Italy, Madrid, Barcelona, and, and things like that is because all these things are actionable, right? You can just go in there and sign a petition and do something connected to it, the public, so that people uh, gather around and contribute, and extensible, meaning that you can all take these Gov Zero Monica and then do whatever in your country. And so this AC principle makes it a minimum that spreads. Um, and so, yeah, in recent history, of course, like Me Too is also another AC principle that really spreads across boundaries, across different uh, social media settings and things like that. And so, yeah, we're going just to see more and more use of horizontal power or new power uh, in the information society. And I think uh, I do agree that this new kind of power is complementing, but not reinforcing the vertical power and just as Buckminster Fuller has said, you know, if you see an old system that's broken, don't spend your time to fix it. Make a new system that eventually make the old system obsolete. And that is exactly what we're doing now. Um, and what's my take on WikiLeaks? Well, I, I mean, they're, they're journalism. Uh, and many of them uh, are basically taking the, um, each country's um, take um, journalism and pushing it to a, a logical kind of logical end and so it kind of forces every country or every government government to uh, take a really deep breath and look inward and think how exactly uh, our journalistic freedom core and how much is it instrumental and every society has a different standard and I'm, I'm not here to judge any other society but I will share just one um, visualization with you, which is the Civicus um, monitor. I don't know how many of you have, um, have seen this. Um, this is a um, global monitor um, like Freedom House, but it uh, focuses on the space <laughs> of um, civil society, the freedom of expression, assembly, and journalistic freedom, and things like that. So um, as you can see, if you zoom into Asia, Taiwan is the only principle. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, literally. <laughs> okay, right. Now, now, this is not saying that we're doing better than you know, New Zealand, Australia, or Nordic um, counterparts. But, but if you um, click Asia, you click open, and all you have is, I'm sure, Taiwan. Right. So, um, and, and, and this, this shows that, that this is part of our identity at the moment, the maximization of journalistic freedom, uh, the maximization of people's uh, freedom of expression. The government completely trusts the people through the joint platform, e-participation platform, referendum, things like that. But we don't ask the citizen to trust people. We think we need to earn that trust from citizens. 
Many other countries are doing exactly the other way around. The government doesn't trust the citizen, but asks the citizen to trust the government, which is called fascism, by the way. But I'm not here to criticize other governments. What I'm saying is that here in Taiwan, we pride ourselves as putting the civil society and the room of civil society first, and which is why um, you know, we tend to encourage the civic hackers and engage the civic hackers and making sure the civic hackers feel that they're contributing to democracy as well and get to meet the president every once in a while and things like that. One of them even became the digital minister. Um, okay. um, now, six people would like to know, um, do you participate uh, in any smart cities initiative? I do, actually. How do you think digital transformation would impact cities development? This is an excellent question. Um, yeah, I'm an uh, advisor to the Taichung City uh, Smart City Initiative. Uh, I'm uh, a co-chair of the Asia Connecting to Silicon Valley. The dot is uh, pronounceable. Uh, pro please pronounce the dot. The Asia dot Silicon Valley uh, Initiative, uh, as well as the Digital Plus uh, Initiative, and all of these are related to Smart City. And um, I will use a concrete example to talk about the kind of smart city that we're talking about. Um, yes, this is one of the flagship uh, smart city uh, demonstration sites that will open later this year, I think by the end of this year, right after the election. Um, and so this is the Shaolin Smart Green Energy Science City. It is right next to the high-speed rail station. So it is like a zoo uh, that you can very easily visit. And once you go there, uh, you will see lots of self-driving vehicles just washing around and um, participating in a lot of simulated um, experience. <laughs> Uh, for example, the uh, round trip of the goddess Mazu here uh, called Raoqing. Um, I don't know if this, if this translates or not, but in Taiwan we have a lot of very unique traffic situations with motorbikes, with people you know, holding the goddess and um, you know, crowding um, various different streets and so on. So it's very important that any self-driving vehicle understand those kind of local traffic patterns be before we unleash it to the uns unsuspecting. Um, citizens, uh, and so all this um, is meant so that people can see uh, first time, just like in a zoo, how those new um, sentient-ish uh, animals behave, and uh, the kind of um, way we use to build a smart city is by having the social innovators, many people innovating to make things better for everyone, uh, to challenge existing laws and regulations. And so this is my main contribution, I guess, uh, is sandboxorg.tw, which is bilingual, and hopefully it doesn't crash. Um, here we go. Right, sandbox.org.tw, very simply put, is that if you have an idea that improves a city, and that you find that the existing regulation uh, prevents you from um, you know, executing your idea, or that you're unclear whether this is allowed or not because the regulation simply did not anticipate it. You can just enter your use case on Sandbox RGTW and a team of very well-paid and therefore pro bono lawyers uh, will make sure that uh, the local municipality actually understand the case you're making, uh, take some time to meet with you, and then basically just interpret the regulations to your favor. Uh, now, the, why this is not entreating or lobbying is because all of this conversation is in the open. Um, people who have different takes, people who have reservations and so on, they can all comment on this kind of roundtable discussions. And even if it actually breaks the law, for example, if you want to um, introduce the self-driving vehicles in a way that could potentially harm people, um, we make sure that there are sandbox environments that are designed to be safe, uh, like the Shaolin um, Green Energy City, for people to actually have a lot of mileage to uh, encounter such hybrid vehicles. And so by the end of this year, we, we expect to pass the UV sandbox, which basically the legislator says, if you have any innovation uh, of this kind, it could be a car that flies or a ship that uh, drives or whatever, um, they can just break the law for a year. But they have to first 
and uh, be under public inspection in the Shaolin or some other area for an extended period, then the risk factor and the data sharing, just like those of German tricycles, must be declared. Now then the Ministry of Economy will make sure that uh, you're working with the local municipality to actually solve a local last mile problem of transportation and prove your business model in addition to your technology. And after a year of proving it, maybe people decide it's, it's a bad idea. And so we thank the investors, and somebody else will try a different angle using the data you, that you accumulated. And if it's a good idea, maybe it gets expanded in scope, in speed, and so on for another year. And now, if the regulation change after two months of announcement, then people say, OK, it's a good idea. And then your fork of the regulation gets merged into regulation. Then we request a law change. Uh, the MPs may take up to four years to deliberate how exactly to word the law during which you get a de facto monopoly uh, by, by continuing the experiments and the business model. And once the MP decides on the exact wording of the law, then that becomes a new line of trade and you have competitors. And this is already the case for FinTech. We already have FinTech Sandbox. And the first case is already approved, which is using uh, your mobile phone to open a bank account without providing two photo IDs. Because you did that when you uh, get your SIM card for your mobile phone. And even if you don't have a credit history uh, with the banking system, you already had a banking history with your mobile phone uh, provider, your telecom provider. And so they use that to calculate uh, the kind of loan that you can get. And so this is quite innovative. It breaks quite a few regulations. Uh, they're given a year to break those regulations and see how things work out. But if things do work out, it becomes part of um, you know, daily life and so on. And for a platform economy, we also have another, um, like the National Development Council. If you have a private parking lot that you want to share with people in your city, but only for eight hours a day, uh, like when you go to work or something, um, you can install one of those simple uh, IoT devices that blocks people. Uh, but if you pay through mobile payments, then it lowers down and then they can drive into it. Um, there's many uh, SMEs working on this technology here in Taiwan. Uh, but then uh, previously, the Minister of Finance says, oh, so you're operating a parking lot. And so you have to pay all the taxes and, and, and things like which makes it very unprofitable. Uh, but through Sandbox, people said, hey, if you, um, through a month, on average, every day, you provide less than eight hours per day, then you're not really operating a parking lot and therefore are not subject to the same parking lot regulations. And so before we introduce Sandbox, which is the one stop that everybody can apply here and they will find the right uh, ministry. There's many more actually, the NCC can give you a experimental 5G uh, band for communication and things like that. Anyway, people enter here and then there's Sandbox laws in various different ministries and prior of uh, engaging the smart city innovators, prior to the sandbox face-to-face uh, -face office hour system, um, the Korean Public Service, when they see an innovative application, they have two choices. They can take a couple of days and reject it. It's very simple. Everybody knows how to do it. Or they can take a couple of weeks and reinterpret the laws and regulations to make the innovation. They give it a room to happen, which is quite some work. And so um, by default, by default reaction, um, they kind of just reject those innovation proposals. This is what consistently happens, especially around the continental system uh, law here. But uh, starting uh, this year uh, with the sandbox, we're seeing a drastic change. Because when a new application comes, they can either take a couple of weeks and interpret it so that they can operate or if they reject it, then it enters the sandbox and they have to spend a year with it. And so the criminal public service faced with this choice almost always choose the interpreting things so that people can get away with the experiment. So we're seeing a drastic change on how the career public service receives innovation. And so this is a kind of smart city that I think um, is driven by new innovations, given a chance to prove. Um, and I personally tour around Taiwan to meet people where they are and how exactly their experience has been with those social innovations. Uh, this is Hualien, for example, the people can teleconference in from Taitung. And when I visit, the 12 ministries related to social innovation are in the social innovation lab uh, in near the Jianguo market and seeing through my eyes, so I'm like an investigative journalist or whatever, uh, they see through my eyes how the local people is reacting 
to this new innovation. And when the local people ask questions, they must answer immediately, or at least up to two weeks after each meeting, and everything is transcribed, everything is published online. So previously, if they reach out to a single ministry, Minister A can say, oh, this is Ministry B's business, B can say, oh, this is C's business. But because of everybody in the same room, they don't tend to do that. So they will confer uh, among themselves and figure out some way to actually make things work to those social innovators. So I think this, again, is a way to let the people to, to share their feelings without taking individually four hours of train to Taipei to give a 15 minutes presentation, which is uh, lose all of the context. This is a contextual way to do uh, smart city and smart city governance. I hope that answers the question. Uh, any follow-ups? Yes. Uh, yourself, uh, yeah. So, very quick is, uh, what are the initiatives that you are taking to, uh, in terms of the uh, smart city security? Because obviously smart city has to utilize a lot of data, in terms of personal data or just like open data. Yeah. Uh, what's been done in terms of security of not being, uh, preventing it, the system or the smart city being hacked, mm -hmm. or uh, the information that either the IoT devices your, from your personal phones or like smart, smart yeah, vehicles smart being used. Things like that. Yes, that's a great, great question. So just to, for the uh, for the record, <laughs> the question was about uh, what measure has been taken to enhance cybersecurity, of especially IoT devices like cameras, and to protect um, you know it from being hijacked by, by malicious actors. I, I think that's the question. Um, so for some, example, in, in IPCAM, actually, um, we, we do have a security certification. Um, that basically requires all the IP cam um, to, actually this is not a draft anymore, this is already done, so this is kind of out of date, but anyway, this gets the, gets the idea across. Um, we have a Cybersecurity Act, um, Cybersecurity for Information and Communication Act, and it's going to take place next, uh, January 1st, next year. And as part of this act, it uh, makes sure that uh, in all the different government agencies, even municipalities and local agencies and critical infrastructure and so on, there are dedicated cybersecurity people, uh, white hat hackers, that work with uh, the, the government. And in my office, I have already been experimenting um, with the two we passed. Cybersecurity Act by having uh, certified ethical hackers uh, working with my office and making sure that the office software that my office uses personally is an open source platform for self hosting web apps. And so all this is free to use for all the government officials. Anyone who has any email and in GOVTW can use the chat room, which is Rocket Chat, which is like Slack. Um, file storage, which is like Dropbox, path management, which is like Hello, um, HackMD or EtherPath for document editing. There's a online spreadsheet uh, as well, EtherCalc, which I wrote, uh, and things like that. And so everything here is open source, it's auditable, and we work with white hat hackers over six months. Uh, they go through it line by line and filed like three CVEs uh, for minor vulnerabilities, which are like medals uh, in their trade. Uh, and we make sure that they're paid well, that this audit <coughs> is, is in public, and that we partner with other uh, digital nations. Uh, there's a group called Digital Nations, previously Digital 5, now Digital 7, but they're just going to call them Digital Nations now, um, that agree to share these open source um, government uh, technologies so that we don't have to spend too much effort to reinvent the wheel, but can instead pull our resource around technologies like Sensor that has a proven cybersecurity uh, auditing. Um, history. And also, I think of note is that because we encourage the cybersecurity hackers to, to kind of do penetration testing way before the malicious people do, we, we set up a sandbox and just invited them to, to, to work with us. Um, it enables them to contribute in a way that is visible so that uh, they don't go to the dark side, which always has more cookies. Um, they don't go to the dark side, they remain in the light side, and that we make sure that they're part, they're seen as part of our um, defense in depth design that all the 
um, including smart city, but not limited to smart city, all the government projects starting next January um, will allocate 5% at least to those white hat hackers to do penetration, te penetration testing, auditing, security, proof by design, privacy by design, and things like that. And this uh, is for the largest uh, public projects. The smaller projects must allocate 6%. The smallest project must allocate seven percent of their budget for cybersecurity, and so we make sure that there is an ecosystem for thriving white hat hackers, so that people who study cybersecurity in Taiwan can find very good uh, employment and also social status, so that again they don't go to the dark side. Uh, that's the answer. Uh, other follow-ups, questions? Yes, please do. Um, Related to what you said about the current government has to answer the same question over and over oh, yeah. again to like to media or to I don't know uh, see to see yeah. yeah so how you do it with the education like with people so how do you tell like you know the normal people that you have all this information there that they it's free to use because currently like in my country we don't have that kind of stuff it's just far away <laughs> far too away from us but here I see like. You have all these resources. How you like educate people that to go there and find the find the answer that is already been done, is already been resolved. Yeah. Um, so uh, Google, that that is the standard answer. We make sure that everything is very easily uh, searchable. So that, um, for example, in my um, website, the public digital innovation space. Um, we make sure that all the my blogs or projects and things like that are easily indexed and are like top hits um, by, by Google uh, when you search for the right um, keywords. And uh, I literally uh, publish everything um, that I'm a part of. So uh, any even internal meetings that I am a chair of, I publish the entire transcript after the public service and the, all the stakeholders who attended um, edit for about 10 working days. And so this is not your average government um, transcript. This is basically exactly what people have said and exactly how and when people have said it. So this is a shape like this. And so you can see everybody saying thanks. And, and so this shows the policy making context. Now we kind of hijack the SEO by giving every utterance its own URL, its own page, so that every every sentence that anyone said in any of the meetings that I'm a chair of or I attend gets its own URL, but then uh, it's in context, so you can also see it in context. But then it makes sure that when you Google for things, the right utterance uh, shows up. So this is the first. Um, uh, line. The second line is that we work with the civil society, the GovZero community, for example. So this is um, Vote Taiwan. Um, I I'm sure some of you may have heard of this uh, project mentioned somewhere. Um, so this is uh, Vote Taiwan. Again, it's a GovZero project. It basically takes whatever um, information that the Central Election Committee have published, which you correctly pointed out that the data is all there, but why should the, the people care, right? So the GovZero community basically take whatever open data that people care about, and then you can find, uh, I don't know, a counselor, we're in the north, I guess, uh, we're in Taipei City, I guess, uh, and we're in the Wenshan region, I'm sure. Uh, and then you can see all the people running for counselors here. And they uh, make it kind of fun by showing a complete record of their previous um, campaign donations, <laughs> how exactly they're <laughs> spending the money, uh, how much votes they missed or did not miss, uh, which other positions they have worked on, and they also um, you know, agreed or disagreed <laughs> um, which particular policies uh, in their city council and so on. And, and in general, just you know, make sure that it is a interactive, fun experience to learn more about your city councilors and make it engaging. And, and by the way, I am not particular to this particular counselor. If you if you re refresh, it actually shows randomly a different order, <laughs> so that a, a different person now now becomes the, the uh, counselor that's shown first. If you refresh again, it changes into a different order, right? And so um, yeah, 
So it's not partial to any party. So in, in, in any case, we rely on the civil society to in, indeed gamify the system, to make it into interactive games that people will find interesting to engage. And we use another example, which is a kind of a hot topic nowadays, um, which is um, real-time clarification of misinformation. And so uh, again, in the um, executive yuan, which is the administration's homepage, uh, we make sure that whenever, any day at 7 a.m., uh, we see that there's a misinformation spreading around, there's a rumor about something that we perhaps know something about, uh, then within one new cycle, usually within four hours or so, um, <clears throat> the government uh, will, the responsible agency, uh, will just contribute their their version of what they, the facts they know. So this is like piecemeal, uh, getting people to get into the habit of not spreading misinformation right away, but rather wait for a couple hours and then we come up with our answer. But of course, the civil society may then come up with their answer as well. They make sure that this is like a play-by-play, -play, move by move dialogue instead of a you know a rapid spreading fire or things like that. But I mean, not many people go to the, the administration's homepage. So just, just having this information out there is not very useful. So again, the GovZero people, again, not staffed or paid by the um, government, uh, works on a interesting gamified bot in the instant message system line. Um, and the line system basically, as I said, is end-to-end um, -end encrypted. Um, so people really don't know. And, and this is not um, gender bias, by the way. If you refresh, uh, it changes into a different relationship. Uh, every time uh, you see a pattern right here. So uh, basically you add this line bot as your uh, line friend and whenever you see a rumor, you can spread to it and you can sh reply to it and then you will uh, send it to a co-created co fact-checking system and get back to you, like whether this is missing information, where, where, uh, whether this can be proved and things like that. And this is all public, right? You can see everything is already replied uh, but you can see what is trending <laughs> nowadays uh, in line. It, usually this is, you know, people don't drink this with that or things like that. Even if we're pretty close to the election, still food and medicine related <coughs> things are still dominate um, the current um, spam um, arena. Um, and anything, I, I mean, I, I won't show it for too long, otherwise people suffer collateral damage. But what, what I'm <laughs> trying to say here is that there is an active and vibrant civil society that makes it fun to um, just make sure that these things are collectively fact-checked and that people can also fact-check its own fact-checking. And uh, there are some just personal feelings that are neither right or wrong. And so, again, just by engaging people and making sure that people can engage in a way that is maybe just a few seconds just by sharing something to a line bot. We see what's trending as rumors or misinformation. And if you have a couple of minutes, you can look at it fact checking and maybe contribute a, a hyperlink or two. And if you have a, a couple of hours every week, then they have actually face-to-face -face meetings every Wednesday, I think, and to uh, work out all the rumors and do more in-depth fact checking and things like that. So basically, the civil society, the social sector, takes care of making the data something that is relatable to people and making it fun. And as a government, I think our duty is just to make sure that we don't lie ourselves. If we do, uh, we correct it as, as quickly as possible, uh, and we make the clarifications in time, and we make it in a structured, open way without any copyright or license restrictions so that the civil society can use it as soon as we publish the data. But the last mile is in the social sector in the civil society. Hope that answers the question. Okay, people are okay, so moving on. We're in the age of the forest industrial revolution. Uh, we see a fellow uh, World Economic Foreigners here, um, which gave rise to artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, and big data. How do you visualize the fifth industrial revolution? Uh, that is a great question. Um, personally, I think. Um, so I'm going to, to speak uh, a, a personal anecdote. Um, I have a power button tattooed uh, in the back of my neck. Uh, and um, it kind of symbolizes um, what my take uh, on this thing. Um, I happen to think that at the moment, 
we have collective intelligence, which we already talked for about an hour or so about collective intelligence. We touched a little bit about artificial intelligence or machine learning or machine intelligence, but we did not uh, spend much time talking about how to bridge those two together in a way that is what we now call extended intelligence, meaning that instead of an in individual human, individual machine, or whatever, uh, we feel that we are part of a larger system and we do participatory design in a way that is not just designed for users, but rather for the entire ecosystem. And now I understand that this is all very abstract. So um, let's just... Um, there is a website that I uh, am part of. Uh, it's a bunch of people. Um, Joy Ito and people from IEEE, the person who did uh, GDPR and things like that. And there's a loose bunch of people called globalcxi.org, uh, the Global Council on Extended Intelligence. Uh, and this is our, our vision for the fifth um, industrial revolution. Um, and it includes three basic parts. Versus intelligent and autonomous technologies inspired by principles of system dynamic and design, meaning that it's participatory. The second is to reclaim the digital identity. And then finally, think outside of GDP and think, rethink our metric for success. And these three are very deeply entwined, and we're basically just writing recommendations after recommendations for, for example, how UK should uh, work with toys that are AI-powered to not manufacture addictiveness, uh, but still can bond usefully with children and how children's privacy and concept means and things like that. So, like, um, very interesting topics. Uh, and these are the people we're, we're working on. And so if you want a like, complete uh, picture review, uh, please look at it in uh, globalcxi.org. But uh, usually, um, I don't use that many words, and so I will just read you a poetry. Uh, so, two years ago, when I became the digital minister, um, I had a compact, not a contract, uh, with the central government here. Uh, there are three working conditions that I already alluded to. First is location independence. When, whenever, wherever I am uh, in the world, I am working in the capacity of digital ministry that allows me to work anywhere in the world and working with Taiwan instead of for or in or at Taiwan. So that's the first thing, location independence. The second thing is voluntary association. I don't go to the Minister of Defense and say, tomorrow you're going to open up your process. That's not going to work. I only work with voluntary people. And so I can poach at most one person from each ministry. And they, together, um, the 22 people, forms my staff. But they all get salaries paid by different ministries. So we're a little multi-stakeholder um, community within the national government. And the third thing, as I alluded to, is radical transparency. We we'll make sure that whenever we're doing the policy making, we get the feelings of people and using machine intelligence really to get what people feel about, for example, self-driving vehicles. We send people this kind of, um, this is called POLIS, P-O-L that I uh, open source um, surveys. But the survey are written by fellow citizens. So when you see a sentiment around a particular emerging technology, by a fellow citizens, you can agree or you can disagree. And as you agree or disagree, and this is all radically transparent by voluntary association, um, you see yourself moving, like your avatar moving, among the clusters of people feeling the same way. But then after answering a few yes or no questions, you may be inclined to share your own sentiments for other people to resonate with or not. Uh, but what, one thing you cannot do here is there's no reply button. So the trolls have no place to play, uh, and you cannot make ad hominem attacks or paste some you know, cat pictures or anything like that. Uh, all one can do is contribute more feelings for other people to resonate. And so basically, just by holding the space of dialogue, we always see, after a few weeks, people agree to disagree on a few divisive statements, but they, they focus far more time of this on the consensus statements, trying to refine more nuanced, more eclectic ideas so that people can collectively deliver um, those shared goals and common goals, what we call collaborative learning, when, whenever there's emerging technology. This is remarkably different from normal social media, where the picture is like the other way around. The more people talk, the more polarized they become. And we design the spaces so they can converge instead of diverge over time. And through this method, we did the regulation around Uber's um, you know, um, 
sharing economy, quote unquote, in Taiwan around platform economy. We did all those sandbox regulations as well as using this methodology just by gathering people's consensus. And so this is the kind of collaborative learning that I'm uh, alluding to. And AI is a facilitator, it is a space, it automates away all, a lot of those chores, but at the end, people feel that we're part of something larger, and that can collectively design the kind of future that we want to uh, bring about. And so two years ago, when I introduced all this around the world, uh, the Taiwan government wanted me to be the digital minister, to work with uh, people in Taiwan to kind of popularize the system, and they asked me for a job description. And so instead of a long job description, I just wrote in a poem, which I'm going to read to you now before moving on to the next question. And it goes like this. When we see internet of things, let's make it a internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, Let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that the singularity is near, let us always remember that the plurality is here. And so this is literally my job description. And this is the kind of work uh, that I'm uh, bringing about. You may or may not call it the fifth industrial revolution, but I do think that this moves quite beyond the existing scope that the WEF people calls the fourth industrial revolution. Um, any more questions? Um, if not, we're moving right on. Five people uh, says, how do you define quid, reliable, and quid data? The amount of information available on the internet is huge, and too much resource would have been assigned to classify it. Now, this is a, a, a very um, top-down, hierarchical uh, thinking. Um, it used to belong to editors of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, and um, also in Carta, and also other encyclopedia. And we all know that they get supplemented by this crazy anarchistic collective called Wikipedia. Um, and so um, the answer to this question is that we don't classify it. Any tree-like classification, any taxonomy, is going to fail spectacularly. Because um, as I mentioned, there's just too many too many emerging things uh, for people to silo in in a, any existing taxonomy. So instead of taxonomy, what we're now doing, using all those technologies that I just mentioned, is what we call folksonomy. Uh, it's a real world word, uh, folksonomy. Folksonomy is hashtags. Folksonomy is ad hoc uh, chat room groups. Folksonomy is a manual list that branches out. Folksonomy is a um, distributed ledger that can have a soft fork or a hard fork. Basically, folksonomy lets people classify information in a way that doesn't impose a set, a preset order on the kind of information out there, but instead of relying on the free flow of bidirectional information to make sure that people can build upon the inter textuality of the information at hand. So just think Wikipedia and you have an idea of, of what kind of intertextuality that I'm, I'm talking about. And so whether something is reliable or not is not objectively judged. It is not entirely data driven. It of course connects to our own lived in experience as human beings, but we can use the data, use the information out there as excuses to gather around, to form communities, to have a conversation, to have a lecture like this, and, and things like that, and basically make each of these information a reliable way to get people's attention, to focus on each other, instead of to distract us from each other. And this is what I mean by instead of virtual reality, let's make a shared reality. If people just reinforce our own opinions in a filter bubble and so on, at the end of it, the bubble will just contain one person and one very isolated person. But if we make all the data and all the information social, then the social fabric itself will make sure that people trust each other and rely on each other more instead of treating data or people as nouns or as entities. We tend to think it as verbs and the relationships that's alive inhabits us uh, as kind of vehicles of the living relationship. Now this is a very animist 
view, but if you come from a, a Austronesian or indigenous uh, origin, that when, when I was in New Zealand, I had a long talk with the Maori people there, that is actually the natural view of things. And they even designed their company law to give a seat to a river, and they think this is perfectly normal. Uh, the river can have a seat in the board. There's people from the Crown and from the uh, Maori community pre uh, speaking for the river. The river can take damage. The, the river can sue for harm being done to it and things like that. It gives a river personhood. And so if we can extend the boundary of what we think as legal person, then I think this um, kind of reliability expands much more because then we can circle around even environmental data, not as some code numbers, but as a projection of a living being, a river god or whatever, <laughs> that uh, speaks to people. And this is not a familiar view for, for um, many people um, learning in a more reductionist or dualistic uh, upbringing. But in Taiwan, with the dominant religion being the folk Taoist religion, this is perfectly natural. Uh, and so this is a kind of worldview that we're taking uh, on the information available and the reliable uh, social data. Um, and the question is, is Big Brother watching you? Um, and as the Big Brother watches you, you also watch back to the Big Brother. Uh, and, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I mean, that is true, right? Um, uh, this, there's a word for it, actually. It, it, it's, it's called Susveillance. Um, it's a very, word, a very wordy word, uh, but it's a real word. It's been around for quite some time. Um, there's a wonderful picture on Wikipedia. <laughs> Yeah, just explain the concept very well. I don't even have to explain it. Yeah. So, Sue's <laughs> uh, A drawing by Steve Munz, six year old father, illustrating surveillance versus surveillance. I love it. Uh, Steve Munz is also a part of the Global Council on Extended, uh, Extended Intelligence. So, basically, um, Steve Munz has been wearing these things around uh, since 19. Or something, uh, and basically this is um, making sure that the accountability goes both ways. This is making sure that whenever something happens, there's sufficient amount of corroborations from different um, angles to making sure that there is a shared real reliable reality around things. This makes uh, things much easier actually nowadays with Instagram and, and things like that, that people are bringing a camera around that can kind of do what Steve Wynn did, um, you know, using expensive technology. This is not just part of the norm. Uh, and we really are living in a world of surveillance and people are generally establishing social norms and boundaries and so on. For example, in our collaboration meetings, uh, people have to first agree everyone to get uh, live streamed, and because people are holding the camera is not being filmed, this creates a power asymmetry. So we always prefer, for example, a 360 camera in the middle of the room, so that it doesn't privilege anyone. Or if there are multiple angles, they can be stitched together with the videogrammetry, so that people can relive the experience and things like that. So when we design the room, design the system, we make sure that people share equal power of surveillance instead of being dominated just by the person holding one single camera. So the singularity of the camera is the problem. The plurality of the camera with the sufficient discussion, deliberation of the social norm is less of a problem. And we are totally living in this um, world now. So if you feel watched by the big brother, always remember you can watch back. <laughs> yeah. and, and this is why one of the um, civic tech companies in Taiwan is called Watch Out, actually. Um, so yeah, it, it makes sure that um, yeah, it's just called watch out, uh, and um, it makes sure that it watches, uh, for example, all the different legislative hearings, all the debates, and things like that. And feel free to to support uh, watch out because they kind of enable this possibility of uh, surveillance uh, in a way that empowers independent journalism and encourage independent uh, journalists. Um, so it is a uh, fertile grassland for the civil society, which I'm sure is why they call them civil war right? Okay, um, there's five people asking how to battle fake news from spreading all over media and social networks. Nowadays, are people being fed fake news willingly? So, both of my parents are journalists, uh, like professional journalists, 
I never use the F word, fake uh, word myself, to refer to news. This is not just out of filial piety, but also because uh, I think this word is very unhelpful. It describes two very different things. It describes a journalistic mistake, a real journalist making a piece of news. Nevertheless, contains misinformation because they, you know, get rushed by their editor to publish a story or whatever. But it's still journalism, it's still news, it just contains misinformation. Or it can refer to something else entirely. Um, some may, maybe malicious, maybe not, organization spreading this information under the veil of looking like journalistic outputs while not holding themselves to any journalistic integrity and indeed just mocks the journalistic layout of the message. Now this we call disinformation. Fake news may refer to journalistic misinformation or it may uh, refer to disinformation. And when I talk to uh, Mayor Ko and Jay in Taipei, he thinks it refers to neither of these two things. He thinks uh, fake news refers to a real piece of journalism, but published with a misleading title. He thinks it's you know, fake news. So uh, it means very different thing to many different people, which means it's very unuseful and indeed unhelpful in a front of journalism uh, when we talk about uh, disinformation or misinformation. And so, first, I don't use the word myself, but feel free to continue to use it. I'm not going to censor it, right? We're not that kind of society. Now, um, I, I think that this question referred to disinformation, that is to say, uh, intentional uh, spreading of information that is that the spreader even knows to be wrong, at least the first one, the spread knows to be wrong. So, um, first I think of it in terms of an epidemic, of a virus of the mind, like, kind of like flu or influenza. Um, so you, you don't actually negotiate with the flu, right? Because it's not in the same category, they're just not human beings. So it's like spam. Uh, it is something that is created because there is an economic or political incentive. And I still remember in 1999 or 2000, there's a bunch of people uh, working uh, on what we call spam wars, uh, myself included. I work on spam assessing and things like that. Uh, cool project names uh, decided to combat, combat spam. And, but at the end, spam did not become that large a problem. But it's not because one single government has passed any draconian law, or a single technological invention has been done, or that people have uh, secured the root um, uh, email servers of the internet, or that people have uh, flagging spam as part of their habits, or that people have used larger uh, email vendors such as Gmail or Hotmail. It's a combination of all these factors. Each factor increased the cost of spammer by a little bit and decreased their uh, expected return by a little bit. And at some point, it doesn't pay to send spam anymore. And then we don't see spams being sent after that much. And so around this information, we're doing exactly the same thing. It's a multi-stakeholder uh, picture. We're uh, working on media literacy starting next year, basic education. The teacher is going to be non-authoritative. <laughs> uh, any teacher of any uh, kind uh, need to discover emergent information on the internet, talk with the student, discuss how they frame it, what kind of agenda does the, the information center is trying to get, and things like that, and basically teach critical thinking by example in the basic education uh, curriculum, and that is the, the real fix, I think, uh, for the next generation. But still, for this generation, we're also working with like, like the COFAC bot, which is being uh, adapted to WhatsApp and um, I think many other messenger or whatever forms. And then there's also the Taiwan Fact Checking Center and other independent verifiers uh, working on increasing journalistic integrity, uh, of course, real-time clarification from the government, and things like that. So we're improving the ecosystem so that when people see a piece of information, it will naturally be the, their first um, expectation to respond it with is it real or not? So th this is actually very useful. Even these four words by itself is very useful, social innovation. Because if you see something that engage with uh, the part of your brain that enrage you, that want to spread outrage, it, it, it does help if you must type something uh, re in return. It does help if you type 真的假的? question mark. Is real or not? Because then everybody takes a deep breath and actually does some, have some mental room for source tracking 
or very funny for uh, comparing different sort of things instead of being hijacked by the emotion that associates with the picture. Um, there's many other uh, devices and tools that we're uh, helping developing uh, to tone down the emotional um, load and stress uh, on social media and on people and things like that. Uh, but at the end, I think it's up to every individual uh, to think deeply and listen deeply around all the different sides of a public issue, like uh, the, the deliberation that I just talk about with air quality, with Uber, with whatever. Once people do that, listening deeply to people, we become immune to PR agenda around that particular topic. And that, I think, is a real cure. And the, the question nowadays is that uh, people educated in the previous regime before the martial law gets lifted um, were raised in an environment where there's one standard answer. Uh, it's spelled in a certain way. It's written in a certain calligraphic style. Uh, it's spoken by uh, certain uh, rulers with a space uh, before their name uh, and things like that in Taiwan. So it creates kind of a backdoor uh, to their minds that the virus of the mind, uh, the memes and the disinformation kind of pick it back on. And this kind of media literacy for adults raised in the martial law era, that is also something that this kind of um, inoculation device, this, or that kind of media literacy um, can really use help on um, intergenerational solidarity. So basically having people armed with the Kofax plot or whatever to explain very patiently to their grandparents that not everything printed with the photo of Wu Shi is spoken by Wu Shi or, or things like that. And I think that, again, is a multi-year project that we will eventually prevail. Uh, we have some have an hour left. Um, has information become the most important currency nowadays? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, I, I think the most important currency nowadays is trust. Uh, it is the most scarce resource, mostly because um, in the early days of the internet, people have this theory of swift trust. If you see someone on the internet using the same keyword as you use, you tend to trust that person immediately and start working on projects together. That was the internet in the early 90s. And uh, people created the whole theories of swift trust, um, how and why people trust people, random strangers over the internet, and start collaborating and entrusting the intimate details of one's life and things like that. That was the, the early days of the internet. So it turns out that swift trust is possible because of a uh, psychological mechanism called projection, or here we translate it as novel. Uh, novel, I don't even translate that. Uh, feeling in, in a head, and, uh, I have a head feel, brain feel, whatever, right? Um, novel, um, um, so it's a, um, right, so it's a projection, um, it of course, could be a, a very vivid. Uh, is what is the stuff the dream is made of. <laughs> so it's very vivid, it feels highly personal, but it's often wrong. And you see that even nowadays with a live stream or with a Skype call or whatever, if the resolution is uh, 720p or less, uh, you don't see the micro expression of the person talking. You don't really know how they feel about this particular thing unless you're watching it on 4K or 8K video, right? So again, in a low resolution or mid resolution, all the micro expression is lost. And we end up filling in those micro expressions with whatever we project on, on that person. Um, a um, very famous case happened the day before the previous presidential election. Uh, there's an actress, Zhou Ziyu, uh, that filmed a particular uh, film that uh, makes everybody project very different things on it and actually um, maybe helps Dr. Tsai Wong by a larger landslide than she already would have won uh, for, for that particular election. But had that film been filmed in 4K, it would not have the same experience. It would not have the same effect. The whole effect is born out of projection. And so, because now people are gradually becoming aware that internet, uh, social media relies on this kind of projection, there is kind of a, a detachment to it. People are generally becoming aware that this is like selling addiction and addiction to her own mental projections. And so, people start to go the other way around. That is to say, a large distrust 
of any information that people receive from any media channel whatsoever. And so that makes trust become scarce. And sometimes people want to recover it through algorithm, saying, you know, blockchain governance, the math guarantees this property of the system, and you need to trust the math, but not everybody is a mathematician, that's the main problem. Uh, or people say AI will make unbiased decisions as long as you feed it big data instead of sample data, it is trustworthy more so than any person, but on the other hand, it doesn't auto-correct its own bias. So basically, the old text-based normativity of what people read on newspapers or so on, the trust level is declining. Uh, this is called democratic recession, by the way. Uh, but the newer normativities, the code-based ones built on blockchain or whatever, automated system, and database ones built on machine learning or whatever, has not yet gained legitimacy in a way that can replace or even augment the old text-based normativity. So that means that there's no social system that's scalable at the moment that everybody, regardless of background or ethnicity or cultural background, trusts. So I think that is the most scarce resource and that is what we need to be working on. And this is the currency nowadays um, that we're uh, improving. What is the most impressive recent digital innovation? Uh, there's so much of it. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I don't even know how to begin. Uh, but but I, I think um, at, at this particular moment, I, I, I would still um, say that the very fact that the internet is still around, <laughs> that the internet uh, managed to not balkanize itself and not taking over, being taken over by people insisting on centralizing the, the internet itself and so on. I think internet governance uh, itself, the society that runs the internet, that managed to stay independent despite all this nationalistic agenda to take it over or fragment it, remains the most impressive. <laughs> I mean, it's been around for 40 years or so, but at, in the early days, it, it doesn't suffer so much from the attack, the malicious uh, actors, the cyber wars, the uh, state actors trying to organize it, um, and, and so on. But nowadays, the internet itself, the governance of the internet itself, is under unprecedented stress, but still, the internet governance still managed to hold on in a way that still invites everybody to join, any stakeholder can still voice their concerns. The core internet standards are still done in a way that is not stakeholder, that is still cause of the request for comments instead of succumbing to any um, sovereign nation with an army and a navy. So I would still say that the internet protocol itself being reinvented many times over, hardened, secured after Snowden, um, switched massively now in Taiwan to uh, the version 6 of the internet protocol after the exhaustion of the IPv4 resource. So those very basic things that are largely invisible are actually requires constant struggle to keep open in a way that is not being captured by any particular uh, interest state actor or uh, multinational um, corporation. So I would still say that internet governance, the internet society itself, is the most in impressive and still pretty recent. Uh, just a few decades of digital innovation. Um, does the Ministry of Life and Position change my mindset and original thinking and how? Uh, meaning that I become a copy of myself or something? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I still think I do a lot of original thinking, but in, in any case, um, I think that the position affords me um, kind of a um, unique perspective as a conservative anarchist working with a governmental system. Uh, the last time any anarchist took a ministerial position, I think, was during the Spanish War or something. Uh, so it was quite some years ago, before the digital revolution. Uh, I mean, we do have uh, anarchistic politicians, politicians that mostly write poetry like me, um, um, Brigitte some, something uh, from the Icelandic Pirate Party is a very good example, but Iceland Pirate Party, I mean she did not, as uh, far as I know, uh, become a minister, uh, so so far I'm still the only one doing this, uh, but there's many MPs around the world that are calling themselves radically central centrist or conservative anarchist or politician now, so we're a bunch of people uh, who basically see politics as something that is undergoing a collective reimagination, 
that we're insisting on never commanding anyone or taking orders from anyone. And we've always done that in the open source and open culture societies. And we want to push the envelope and see how far the political system can go tolerating and working with and struggling with people like us who insist on radical transparency. And of course, there's some pushbacks. For example, I don't get invited to any military drills. When there, whenever there's a military drill, I just take a day off. So I, I don't know where the bunkers are because I cannot touch any state secret, you see, because of radical transparency. This surveillance also goes into you know, the government itself. And so I basically say any top secret, any confidential information, unless you, know, you want to make a WikiLeaks situation, please just don't send it to me. Just Please just bypass me. Uh, so, so that is kind of a compromise I have to make as additional minister for radical transparency. But then, on the other hand, the career public service loves it because previously, if things go well, the minister get all the credit. And if things go wrong, they get all the blame. And this is a pretty bad idea for them, so they don't tend to uh, talk around much about the innovation that they're, they're making. And um, the worst case, they just make a few innovations and they get shut down by the minister. But because of the, in the drafting stage, the FOIA law, the Freedom of Information law, doesn't allow uh, people to publish drafting stage information. The people never know the context or the why of policy making. But because it's part of my three contact, I say, you know, every meeting that I'm a chair is required for people to know. So I just publish it. And then now the public service can see, oh, they have very good ideas. They're under their own real name. Whenever they see people complaining about the work that they do, their instinctual um, response can be something other than defending the minister, because the minister doesn't need defending. Um, instead, they can just invite people over. So for example, there was a petition last May that says uh, our tax filing system online is explosively hostile to its users. I think that's the right translation. Uh, and um, it, the, the e-petition is full of negative energy. I'm going to uh, spare you the content. Uh, but because we have a, a team of participation officers or PAs embedded in every ministry that just talk to those emergent people that's about to go to the, take to the streets, so Yang Jinghan, the PO of the Ministry of Finance, I think within 36 hours, just posted a global invite to everybody who complained about the tax filing system, saying, just by the virtue of you complaining publicly, you are now cordially invited two weeks after to the Ministry of Finance, and we can co-create the tax filing system together. And th that creates a kind of almost magical effect. Uh, before that posting, 80% of petitions was like, you know, calling the Minister of Finance to step down or blaming or a lot of ad hominem attacks or whatever. But after the invitation, 80% of which become constructive criticism, people start donating um, their expertise and things like that because they know that their voices will be taken in to the co-creation workshops, which is live streamed and people can participate, um, you know, over the internet as well. And this is the petitioner. And, and he's so angry because he is a user experience designer. And so he's an expert in these kind of things. And he just, you know, cannot take, uh, for example, there's, you know, uh, explosion of words or it's, so barrackly confusing, I don't know how to translate this, or that uh, la last year the text filing system, um, at the end of the user journey, uh, there's a little mascot that pops up that thank you for the contribution uh, to the society. Some of you uh, may uh, know it. Um, and then people uh, pointed out, um, you know, I don't feel well filing text already, so please don't try to make me feel better. Just shorten the experience uh, and things like that. And, and all of this, we don't harmonize. You know, the words that people put forth on the internet, everything is collected in this kind of shared user journey and port. And we use the standard, you know, user journey, agile, um, development, co-creation workshop, uh, facilitation methods to invite all the people who complain into co-creation. And now, this flips around to minister public service relationship. If these things go wrong, it's all my fault. <laughs> and because nobody really is doing this. But if any of this goes right, then the current public service lets the people who petition see how professional they are and also learn from the professionalism from the people who complain about it. So we this year we made this 
become this, which is, of course, much better. But we can always make a design much better if we spend enough budget on it. But this has two unique points. First, uh, the budget for this is actually negative because some, some person during the co-creation workshop pointed out rightly that uh, we waste too much computational resource by preparing for the same computational resource every day during May, which is the text filing period. Actually, only the first two days and the last two days requires this much computational resource because that's when people file taxes anyway. So we use el elastic computing cloud whatever, technology to make sure that we don't spend more than we require during the text filing session. And that uh, saved massive amount of government budget, and we used only a fraction of which to run the workshop. So this is, um, you know, a, a negative budget success story. And this year, I think the approval rating for this system is 96% or something. But even the remaining 4% of people don't head to the street because they know that if they feedback uh, to the channels that they already build trust with, the participation offices, their ideas will be taken into account in the next year's text filing system. And so again, this system is not just a service. It becomes the social object around which the people can have a real conversation about. So, I mean, my role in it is just to absorb the risk, really. If things go wrong, it's all my fault. But on the other hand, there's all those people who complain making the co-creational uh, purposes. So it doesn't change my mindset. I'm still seeing myself as a channel, as an amplifier of the collective intelligence. But I think it does allow me to view things from a perspective that involves a uh, scale of participation that's previously very difficult to do as a independent researcher or as a civic hacker or even as a consultant with Apple or Oxford University Press. It's very difficult to find people who feel so passionately angry about our product and service so much so that we can harness their collective intelligence into co-creation. This is a unique position that can attract like that lightning rod, the collective um, you know, um, emotion, and then uh, create the potential of people, which is the same thing. You know? um, right, so we have, yes, we have a follow up. Yes, I, I have a question about, uh, this is possible in Taiwan, I mean, as you pointed out on the Freedom of Expression uh, website, yes. yes, the Civicus org, yes. uh, this is possible for Taiwan in 2018, what I mean, for example, uh, how could you or what suggestions would you make for countries which have uh, problems with freedom of expression because I think all of our societies have this same uh, uh, thing that where we as a collective we want to express ourselves and improve everything you know but if you do this in Guatemala they will uh, try to shut you down you know so uh, I want to know what suggestions you have for the rest of the world Right. That's an easy question, isn't it? <laughs> um, so I think the, the answer is threefold. Uh, I can answer as an individual, I can answer as Taiwan's digital minister, and I can also answer as kind of a, a poet, right? <laughs> as someone who, who just try to frame discussions because, you know, a, a, a poet, uh, just like a philosopher, uh, we, we don't hoard information. If we, a poet that hoards information is a bad poet and doesn't get remembered. So um, I think I can answer it in, in three different levels. Uh, as an individual civic hacker, uh, I, I do work personally still uh, on secure communication tools, on digital education that uh, assures people of secure communication even in the situations where all they have is individual mobile phones that use Bluetooth to connect to each other and there's no reliable internet transport because when people occupied the parliament in Taiwan, that was like that the first few days and we did provide communication support even in that adverse uh, situation where there's no reliable outbound internet link available. So as an individual civic hacker, we are still working on the mesh networking, on self-organized, um, like the secure scuttlebutt, which is, weird name, but uh, which is like Facebook, but it operates in a way that can be 
disconnected or connected only sporadically and things like that. So we work on technology that enables self-organization and making sure that people can still do activism even if they are in a hostile regime where the connection with the outbound internet is uh, unavailable or generally unavailable. Sandstorm is actually one of those technologies that runs perfectly well on your Raspberry Pi or on your laptop and can still power groupware even though you're uh, shut off of the uh, outward internet. So that's as an individual technologist. As I was digital minister, um, my, my role is mostly proving that opening up this much space to the civil society actually doesn't harm the legitimacy of the government. That it sometimes recovers the legitimacy of the government. That it sometimes makes people trust the government more just by co-creating tax filing or the healthcare experience or whatever experience. People trust each other more and therefore also the legitimacy of democracy more. And as we spread the story, um, I think it makes a lot of sense for not just the digital nations, the developed uh, dem democracies, but also people who are kind of torn in between of whether we go more authoritarian or whether we go more democratic to see a clear example and some ready-made tools that doesn't charge them license fees that can nevertheless be used to improve their democracy. And that is actually this year we added um, digital governance next to agriculture, technology, medicine, or whatever, to our Ministry of Foreign Affairs a list of exports. And so to anyone who may or may not be the official diplomatic ally of the Republic of China government, uh, and anyone, uh, anywhere in the world, as long as we work on the same sustainable development goals, regardless of your diplomatic status as an anarchist, I don't care. Um, I'm happy to help both personally and in my official capacity to increase the legitimacy of the democratic governance by exporting this system. And we work with various other nonprofits and foundations and, and uh, various other international organizations to do that. And even with the UN, which we don't have an official relationship with, um, I'm nevertheless appearing as a robot to many meetings, one of which is live streamed, many more is not live streamed, and working on curriculums and so on together. So that's my, my official capacity. And as a poet, um, and as someone who think about things, um, I, I think our main export, really, just like the Global uh, Council on Extended Intelligence, or um, the F uh, Global Future Council, which is sponsored by the GSMA, or the UN SDSN, the Sustainable um, Development Network, which is powered by people who think a lot in Vatican. All they do is think a lot very deeply about things. Um, um, I mean, they are a very good ally and always there. Uh, also to talk uh, and participate in the Vatican Hackathon, actually. Um, and I think we ally with people who think very hard about these kind of things and create new powerful narratives that makes it attractive for people to think about fellow citizens as fellow citizens and not as quote troublemakers, unquote. And I think this is only possible if we show that it is a, a natural tendency for people to antagonize people who don't look, who don't think, who don't speak, or whatever, uh, like each other. And so this is um, the kind of narrative we're, we're now making is through um, efforts like Common Voice, which I highly encourage you from very different countries and backgrounds to participate. We engage with global social enterprises like Mozilla uh, that basically allows people around the world, anybody, to donate their voices uh, and you can listen to um, people recording and press yes or no. <laughs> Um, whether they actually um, spoke those utterances correctly. And there's many, many different language communities uh, here. Many of them, uh, what we call low resource communities, mean that they don't have sufficient clout to, to convince Microsoft or Apple to do collection for their uh, community and societies. And at the end of this year, we're going to pass the National Languages Act, which makes Taiwan a place with 22 or 23 official languages. Uh, and all the indigenous languages, Taiwan is Hongo, Taiwan is Hakka, and uh, everything, it become official languages. And any school can teach calculus or physics or whatever in any of those languages. And the Ministry of Education must provide sufficient database for anyone to who learn anything in any of those languages. And a lot of machine learning work that we're now doing is making sure that the few people who can teach 
physics or astronomy in Amis or in Banza, uh, in indigenous language, gets a AI boost to automatically transfer learning that uh, corpus into Sakilaya, which is very closely related, but not quite Amis and things like that. And through this kind of solidarity, we can make sure that people feel that they are kin to each other, living on the same island, and not because of that this indigenous nation only has, you know, uh, 50, um, thousand uh, active speakers, the other one only has 5,000 active speakers that were somehow uh, inferior or superior to one another because using digital technology, we can fluidly translate between those different cultures. So that's, I think, um, I have two more minutes. Any last questions? Yes? Maybe I'll have something more, more personal in the sense to understand how much much how, uh, how much stress you get from your position because it seems like social temper. You said that when things go well, the honor is for the ministry. And yeah, when things right. go wrong, is that it's your own responsibility. Yes. So I would like to know so how do you find your work interacting with the other ministry? What's their reception? What, is there any kind of hostility or they, they accepted your work mm -hmm. full heartedly in mm -hmm. that way? Because it seems to me. It's very innovative what you're doing. Mm -hmm. It's very transformational. Mm -hmm. And any transformational activity, as we learn, like transformational leadership, mm -hmm. involves a lot of personal stress. Mm -hmm. So what's your motivation and your goal? Yes, my hobby is troll hugging. Uh, and um, I, I wrote a blog about this in 2009. So it's, it's I mean, for at least 10 years, um, I have let the world know that my hobby is troll hugging. Um, and troll, as you know, are people who make toxic comments on the internet, right? So it's my personal hobby to engage with trolls. Uh, and whenever I see anyone mentions me by name and write a hundred words uh, that are ad hominem attacks, uh, trans, um, such a name or whatever, right? Um, I, I engage with that part of this person. Maybe it's 100 words. I pick out the five words that are constructive, where they reveal something of their own authentic experience, and focus on those five words and make a complete reply, sometimes a video reply, sometimes a type reply to those five words and to make the entire social media know that I'm willing to spend an equal amount of attention, but only if it is a constructive part. And the non-constructive part is as if I don't see it at all. And the trick of doing this, since you framed this as a personal question, so the trick why am I uh, and how am I doing it, is that I see a certain word, maybe it makes me feel upset or angry or whatever, but instead of you know replying it, which is a visual to visual uh, memory, uh, I use cognitive behavior theory, the theory trick, um, the CBT trick, which is um, accept the visual stimuli and create a stimuli in other modality. For example, I just get some jasmine tea, uh, which smells really good, or I play some, use, uh, some um, music um, that uh, listens uh, and that feels very well, and so on. So create a non-visual stimulus that is uh, pleasurable and associate that visual stimuli with something that is pleasurable in other modality. And it creates a new uh, memory that is nevertheless uh, part of long-term memory because it's new stimuli. And so through this CBT trick, um, which is actually more closer to ACT, but I mean, this is a psychology class, so anyway. So um, by accepting this visual stimuli and responding it with another sensory stimuli, the next time when I see this combination of words, I think of the pleasurable experience that I have associated with that. So after 10 years of practicing troll hugging, pretty much any name calling or any word, whatever I see on the internet triggers a happy memory. And so, <laughs> so it, it's in, it literally impossible to offend me with words now, uh, or, or with imagery or whatever, because any visual stimuli I just, just balance it out this way. And, and so then I get to focus and then I get to respond on the substantial part, the constructive part. And more often than not, the troll gets reformed. They, they get a, the invitation. I literally invite them to the social innovation lab and I sometimes just give them a hug, like a physical hug. Because the trolls are like this, because they crave the attention that they, they don't get from the, the real physical world. Because they don't give 
um, each other and I don't know, they don't receive enough hugs or kisses or whatever, right? They don't get care enough. So, so they uh, wake up feeling very empty and they figure the only way they can get attention is by writing toxic words on the internet, which they do get attention uh, by people feeling upset and shouting at them. But on the other hand, this is transactional. This is not a relational, like I said, data is a relation. This is not a relational. So by the next morning, they wake up, they still feel very empty. And there's a different set of people they offend, and a different set of people who give them the kind of junk attention that they crave. And the, the things doesn't go well for them. Actually, it's a mental illness. Um, and so just by focusing on the authentic part of their utterances and engaging in a full modality, often with a recorded video or whatever, uh, people learn that first they can get attention if they reveal something authentic about themselves. And second, the internet only exists as an invitation, as a medium for people to meet physically and give each other a hug. And once I give them a hug, they, they always just get reformed. They turn out to be pretty decent people who were just feeling lonely. And I, I think that is the kind of trick that um, just motivates people <laughs> to gather together around the social innovation lab and the social infrastructures like this. And my true motivation really is that you know, when I was young and I dropped out of high school, I also felt very lonely. Not many people in my neighborhood care about uh, the neuro society or hermeneutics or Immanuel Kant or whatever, things like that. And then I discovered the internet and the community that's willing to engage me in an authentic way. And people who are offered to you know, fly me to places and offer their home for me to stay and things like that. And I'm just returning this favor <laughs> that the internet has done to me when I quit junior high school. And I think this is making the internet, I think, by and large, a better place. Thank you so much. And I should say, now you see what an innovative digital minister we have here in Taiwan. Thank you so much for such a great sharing.